Hi, my name is Joe Jackson. I'm an interviewer and a broadcaster. And what you're about to hear is one of the 1,400 interviews I did for publications such as the Irish Times, Sunday Independent, Hot Press Magazine and for RTE Radio 1. How do I know that there are 1,400 interviews exactly? because I recently digitised all the damn tapes myself. But please remember that many of the interviews were done for the print media and recorded on cassette tapes. So some are, let's say, sonically challenged. But sometimes sonic considerations should give way to historical significance, I believe. And I'm glad to say that at least some powers that be in RT Radio 1 agreed with me on this and broadcast between 2015 and 2018 many of my interviews in a series called The Joe Jackson Tapes Revisited. What follows is one such program edited for this podcast and minus music, which I can't use for copyright reasons. The full tapes can be accessed at joejacksoninterviewer.com. Either way, enjoy. We do to keep talking while you want. No, the reason I don't want, no, I'll tell you what I'm breaking. I'm breaking it down. I want to do two interviews with you. Okay, go ahead. And I want to run it over two issues. Okay. What it means is I'm limiting each time. Yeah. And now two specific areas. Okay. Right? And the first one, the scrapbooks were great help. I want to go back over that history just to remind people. Okay. What you rule. I wore a black armband on Bloody Sunday. I've done all that thing. I was a supporter of civil rights. I was against. Uh, free man. Okay, now what I want to focus on in this one is your own sports career. Do you need some coffee? Yeah, I'd love a coffee before okay. I get rolling. Oh. Okay, like I'm going to go on, Colin. There's two angles on this. This is mostly to do with sports, so I'm glad we've led into that. That you're either a, a right little bollocks yourself, talentless leech living off the backs of great men like Jack, or you are one of our most important social commentators, whether you perceive yourself that way or not. There are the two kind of angles on the intro. Okay. So I've got that one. And then I've heard, this, I'm going to run five ideas by you, which are, I, I had lots of chats with people, and there's no doubt that uh, of all the people I've interviewed, and this is why I said tonight I want two, two shots at Eamon, okay. uh, you generate response. Whatever the fuck he is, he's a bollocks, I hate the bastard, I hope he dies under a bus. And this story that a cook spit in your soup or something, is that true? Somebody told me that and just shared the joke with the people in the kitchen. And then I seasoned it with phlegm and sent it out to you. I didn't know about it. Right, okay. That's why I said that. I think it might be one of those urban myths I heard. Well, it doesn't matter, but you see. I heard the story about Charlie, and some guy doing that to Charlie Hawley. Was that it? He had a steak, he rubbed his steak all over, his bollocks all over the steak. (laughs) And Charlie. And then he came to the table and broke his bollocks laugh, and all the staff were looking at the kitchen while Charlie was eating the steak. Well, maybe this is a variation of that. Tale. I think it might be one of those urban but, myths. But, but yeah. it doesn't matter. That's it shows, okay. you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's yeah. contemporary folklore. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah. some of the suggestions I got, I'm going to give these five. Jesus, you, you got me worried now. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a taster with me. Go on. <laughs> Check yeah. this. Uh, no, you can get a phlegm detector sure. in Hector Gray's. <laughs> You can rub it easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, just this kind of the, the uh, response as to why you, you are uh, perceived to have so much vitriol or vitriol in your, in, in your writing and in your nature. Sure. Well, okay, so just let me give you the five ideas, and I am going okay, to go through sure. more in depth, yeah. but you can give yeah. me a quick response to the whole paragraph when I'm finished. A knee jerk rebel in adolescent sense, outsider since childhood, self conscious about height, spindly frame, poverty. Right, do you want me to answer each of them? Oh, yeah, but just give me an immediate response to that. I think there's some truth in some of it. Uh, definitely, um, outside of since childhood, uh, definitely nothing good height. All right. Not that small. Okay. I'm taller than John Giles. <laughs> I'm as tall as George Best. All right. Uh, okay, let's set out. Um, spindly. No. I mean, All right. I don't have any problem pulling birds, you Have a look. Uh, so that's not it. What were the others? Poverty. Um, oh yeah, um, certainly. And I am going uh, to address these. That certainly, uh, very much a formation of my character was yeah. my childhood. Uh, the kind of extraordinary circumstance of it. It wasn't poverty per se. It wasn't poverty per se. But Don Connor, as you know, it wasn't the poverty area. Right. Don Connor was genteel, low middle class. Um, but our, we lived in a tenement house in Don Connor, which was worse actually. Okay. Because yeah, yeah. co- yeah. relatively speaking. You know, that was a nightmare. And a one-room okay. flat was just like... I want was, to address that. No, you were, you were heavy behind. duty. And, yeah. and, I, and my mother had to fight for... The house was flooded. Yeah, I do want to go in. Don't, don't tell me that. Okay. I, that, I think that was... Yeah, uh, my, my, my mother was a great... Yeah. It is. It's the yeah. core of the formation of right. my, where right. I'm coming from. Yeah. Okay, the second sense of why you have this kind of uh, whatever is in your nature. Failed football or failed to make it as a coach. Probably a flight to the manager of the Irish team was talking to fuck up. Well, uh, none of those things are true. Um, I was... Um, I, 
played for Ireland 23 times. I was a good journeyman pro in a very good, um, what would now be first division, what was then second division yeah. team. Yeah. Um, I was, the only job I had in coaching was coaching London University yeah. for a year, which was the most successful year in their history. Um, they And the people that had preceded me there were Malcolm Allison, Jimmy Hill, Bobby Robson. Uh, some very distinguished people in football, and it was the job given by the Football Association to the people they regarded as, and they had a way of measuring this, as the best coaches. And on right. the coaching course I went to at Lillysaw, which is very intensive, Alex Ferguson was on the same coach, I got one of the highest marks I recorded, 94%. Right, but aspirations beyond that that were not realised in coaching. <laughs> Well, uh, no, no, well, no. I mean, in fact, I came home with John Giles because we, uh, I wanted to come home and live in Ireland. Right. Um, to coach that. Did you want to continue what you had been doing for that year? Oh, I was very ambitious to coach and teach. Right. I mean, I, I thought that okay. was my true vocation. Yeah, right. Um, and um, the trouble was that because I'd been an agitator for reform in soccer, right in through the union right. and outside the union because I'm not a, an institution person. Um, <coughs> um, a lot of club chairmen just said, well, you can have nothing to do with him. Okay. So uh, I... Did you know that for sure? Did they say that your politicisation oh, and your activity at yeah, the political level so. yeah. totally mm. froze you out? Yeah, no chance. All right. Would have took a brave man to employ me as a coach. Okay. All right. Because... Yeah. So it wasn't your failure per se, it was the failure of the system to adapt. Well, I, no, I'd be, I'd be perfectly honest with, with you about everything. Um, right. the, uh, the coaching thing, when I, when I, what actually happened was I came home with John Giles and he was then the big thing in English coaching and management. And yeah. uh, we came back to, to, first of all, because we wanted to live here and secondly, because we knew the English soccer system was so corrupt, so spivish. Yeah. So impossible to work in without corrupting yourself. Okay. We shared that um, conviction. Right. And we wanted to try and create something new. A year into it, back here, I realised that there's no way. This, you can't do this. We want to create a great club in Dublin. Right. And I said, this, the, the League For of Ireland was For the same reasons, disaster. was it? As no, it was, no just, right. it was just that they thought, you know, there was a thing here, like, John wasn't popular here. He, he's a great guy, but somehow... <laughs> Um, an impression of him as a mean spirited, probably because to do it, he was to do it Leeds and okay. he, the testimonial match here, which there was nil nil, and everyone thought they were ripped off. And oh, right. he wasn't good with the press right. and so on. And so, and were you? Had you got a good? Had you got a fandom? Had you got a street following? Had no, kind of, no, no. I was just a sort of second division footballer right. who would played on a lot of losing Irish teams. Okay. All right. uh, I didn't. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I didn't have a. I mean, I, in England, when I finished playing in England, uh, the Times offered me job, soccer correspondent. All right. London okay. Times. So, okay. um, because so I'd written... the Irish Times. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. I, I don't mean to say oh, that, but okay, uh, yeah. it was a big, big right. thing to turn All down. Right. Okay. And I turned it down to come back and work in the League of Ireland. I realised I made a mistake. And half, after six months here, Millwall actually did offer me the job as manager, which is the job I'd always yeah. cherished. Right. But you didn't want to go back. Well, I said, how could I do it? My kids had come. Right. I'd right. committed myself to John, and I said no. Um, so I certainly wasn't a failed coach. Right. Um, I, I, um, but is there a sense that your aspirations in that direction were frustrated, were crippled, were fucked by other forces? Well, I, I, no, I, those words are wrong words, but okay. I, certainly, um, it's certainly tr true to say that um, my aspirations in, in that area were thwarted by... Right. Um, a little bit by circumstances, but the Millwall thing, if you like, offered me the chance to do that if I wanted to. Okay. Um, but I um, didn't, and um, I mean, I'm a f I'm a fatalist. I believe I'm an existentialist. I believe in doing your thing. That it's all new. It it's all you know. Yeah. In other words, don't don't plan too much. An existentialist who believes in God. The Buddha, not Sky God. Right. I believe in Buddha. Oh. I mean, you've got just a colloquial okay. use of the word. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm a, yeah. I'd be a Buddhist. But I want to get that clear. I believe in the karma, right. right? Which I, you know, it's in there. All right. And so you kind of, uh, you start making plans, next thing you're dead, right? All the guys I knew, a guy I used to play with, Harry Cripps, who was a legend in Millwall. Harry was the craftiest fucker of all time. He had it all worked out. Died of a heart attack last week. Oh, yeah, 
you know, that's what happens. All right, okay. Uh, so that coach question is not necessarily... No, it's, it's a valid question because I think a lot of people think, think it. Think it. Yeah, a lot of guys think that that thing. And I mean, Jack, in his own clever way, portrayed me as a bitter little man. Because? Because I hadn't done all these things. Um, uh, okay. No, but I think it has this validity in, uh, in, in this sense, that when I'm writing about soccer, when I'm making an assessment or a judgment about the game and about how well a manager's doing or a player's doing, I think it's not a frustrated guy who couldn't do it. I think it's a guy who uh, can see it so much, and Giles is the same, okay. that you can make, that your judgments are very severe. All right. And that we, in other words, I think, so I think this is, there's a, there's a core of uh, truth in that. I think it's like, for example... So you're as severe as a coach with me on the pitch. Well, yeah, and I'm, 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 I'm say, say, criticising Jack... Uh, against that, excuse me. That you're as critical as a coach would be. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, and I think it's, I think it's an, an informed criticism. Look, and I haven't put that out there now because you're coming to doubt. <laughs> look, this is something I'm going to leave it there all year. All right. Just read that. Who? Pomegranate. All right. All like, right. you know, okay. the and uh, everyone comes in the house gets to see that. It's brilliant. But right. that's for me the ultimate. So it says uh, to my friend. Thanks for all your help. To your yeah. Your help all but, the game. You know, it, it's like this idea that if I was a bollock, or if all I was right. wrong, all right. the first guys who would know it would be the players. players. You ask Kevin Moore, and you ask Ronnie Williams, you ask Paul, David O'Leary, they're all my friends. But all right. I never stick okay. them up front. Yeah. As a, yeah. I never introduce them as an endorsement. Because right. I don't need to get them into trouble. I don't need to be trying to boost my own thing. So Jack can go around on the late list. Yeah. The players hate okay. him. Yeah, no, I'll go in more to that. But, but the yeah. thing is, Just yeah. the core question of well, the core question you about that is, as a... if your judgment is good and it's sound, the, f the players will respect you. All right. Andy Townsend in his book with Paul Gimmage, like the same thing. You know, when I walked on the plane to go to America, this is guy, like, he's, he's spot on. Right. Right. Sometimes he goes over the top. Okay. Da, da, da. But that's a great compliment to a journalist or any critic. Yeah. in any business because it means that although you're going against the general trend critically and what other journalists and commentators are saying you're 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 making the bridge between the fan and the dressing room they're both having the same discussion right, right. and that's the greatest what thing fan, what fan doesn't go over the top screaming out there and the well advice. sure but the, no but the thing Joe is this that it's very very rare in any form of criticism whether it's theatre music uh, or commentary, whether it's politics and that, that the guys inside get the feeling that the people outside are getting the real story, even about our game. All right. So if you can build that bridge, which as a football writer I'm trying to do and started from the very beginning, even my own book, you know, the first book I wrote, yeah. I say, do away with the myth, sure. do away with the bullshit. That's, that's what it's really like for you guys. And that, you guys, is the, the consumer, the person who buys the paper. Right. And so... It, it's within that sort of that's the aspiration all the time to bridge that gap and to be credible with the players the professionals and to be credible with the the fans well you're trying to be it's a great by thing. extension by, by subterfuge <laughs> tell them how oh, not at all no but I'm saying <laughs> but it gives the, the criticism a kind of edge uh, the, yeah. and when I have been over the top it's like criticising Liam Brady when all he was right. playing yeah or maybe a couple of times with Jack, Mick McCarthy, yeah. when I have been so severe and unforgiving and the language has probably been inappropriate or, you know, too emotive. Yeah, I mean, there's very few players I've criticised. Right. It's generally yeah, know. very, very few. But there have been players like McCarthy and Brady, yeah. two examples. Yeah. It's, um, it's a, a reflection of the intensity of feeling and the intensity of, of involvement of someone who really knows a thing and really loves it. I mean, it's my passion. I love soccer. I love sport, actually. Would you rather be a coach? No. All right. Okay. Definitely not, okay. because I could have. I mean, I could have yeah. done it later. Okay, third part. Thank you for no. that very detailed answer. <laughs> okay, third one of reading I heard is that you are ill, you have back trouble, your liver's fucked, you're hooked and bound. <gasps> Vitriol and writing reflects the poison in your system. Yo, Eamon, <laughs> run that by me again. <laughs> No, I'm not, I, well, I have a bad back. Uh, right. That's true. That's true, and it's a, it's, but it's not as bad as it was. Uh, okay. It used to be chronic. I had a successful operation, but I do have a bad back. 
Which stems, which stems from what? I mean, football. was it an accident? Okay. No, football. Oh. Wear and tear. So I was very light. Yeah. I was a stone lighter than anyone else playing okay. the football league. According to Rothman's book, which they have right. up there. I might have it up there, actually. And I used to look and say, is, is any nine stone four weaklings coming okay. into the league? I was nine stone four. And 17 years, it's a, it's a football very physical, right. physical, physical. Right. So at the end of it, I had chronic back trouble. And um, uh, I still have kind of serious back trouble. All right. Yeah. And so I have a lot of pain. Right, so um, Upton Valley and Vitriol based on poison and system. Never take Valium in my life. <laughs> nah. No, 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 vitriol, no. Are you drug addicted because of the back? Do you have, I mean, I'm not no. drug addicted. I mean, do you have to take stuff every day to kind of kill the pain? I take the odd couple of salts, yeah. Is that it? <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. it. I'm not addicted to anything. No, oh. no, not at all. I mean, I you have my rocket chair over there, oh, and okay. I have I go to... No, the way I cope with my back is there's a guy who's... What's it called? It's the something treatment, what's it called? Jane knows it. Okay. She took Alexander right. technique. Oh yeah, I heard it. Uh, he's a good guy, yeah. and I go to him, and it's posture basically. Okay. So I'm not addicted so not to anything. My liver, I'm a modest drinker. Um, my average daily consumption would be two glasses of wine. I drink a bottle of Bex when I'm out, and then endless be- bottles out. No, not at all. I, tell you, I usually have three bottles of Bex. Uh, then if I go to dinner, I have a couple of bottles of wine. And what I do is about once a fortnight, say, you'd know this for I sure. Blow up. Yeah, big time. Because, oh, yeah. yeah. like, I, I do sort of the, the work is intense. Um, and some of it, like, I give it a lot. And then I need to go boom. But I know exactly what I'm doing. Right. I, I drink. Uh, I smoke a joint. I fucking go for it. And I come home at six. I love walking home at six in the morning when there's no one on the streets and it's dawn. And I just love that walk from Joyce, uh, and I'm coming home, and I'm fucking happy as Larry. And I'm, when I'm out all night, I'm happy as Larry. And right. I don't give a fuck about right. anything, right. and I don't make any apologies for that. Right. Um, but okay. I know that it, I know that there's guys out there who think I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, guys have written to me, look, we know you have a problem. Right. I mean, I, believe me, uh, you know, the, I, I am actually, and always have been, quite a modest drinker. Uh, what so about, my liver is in good shape. What about suggesting that you sell stones so often you don't get fucked about anything you eat? Never. I, I smoke, I've always smoked dope. I smoke right. about... I smoke dope uh, about... Let me see. We never smoke in the house. Ever. Why? Because we're happy. Well, man, we're oh, fantastic right, okay. relationship with Jane. Right. Okay. And, like... Um, but some people's relationship is actually accentuated. Yeah, but we're... we're, we're I know that, Sam. It's always she. All right. And okay. it's actually short term. We don't need them. I mean, we're really happy. I you mean, mean short term accentuation of the happiness people are sharing. Well, I think, I think, when I think when I was, I knew friends. You know the syndrome. I, I, mean, I know the syndrome. Yeah. I think when people's relationships are fucking up, they use it. Oh, okay. Like the way George Best used booze. Yeah, yeah. They get over shyness, they get over inhibition, da 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 da. But um, Jane and the woman I used to live with before, Inga, who was I'm still great friends with, I mean, we have a very happy home. Oh, I right. mean, you get the feeling in the home, or maybe you don't, but we That's have a happy, relaxed. well, we're just happy, and it's cool, and like I'm, laid back kind of guy I read watch the racing um, I bet gamble um, do you know when I smoked dope Joe I'll tell you when I smoked dope when after when I'm walking from the Shelburne or the Stampa with Pearson right. down to Lily's right I, I smoke a joint to keep it going and to annoy Pearson he won't fucking smoke I was like that's a fucking stuff <laughs> but um the, the thing I wouldn't is, say we're the only person who goes into that establishment not as straight as others might be yeah. going into the door. <laughs> no, exactly. But the thing is, I, I mean, I, I'm going to write something about it. They should, All right. you know, they, they should legalise cannabis and they should, excuse me. The, the, point. The, yeah, I think they should consider legalising um, drugs and we should have that. Which debate. drugs? Though? What drugs? All drugs. All drugs. Mm. Including coke, ecstasy. Crack heroin, the whole shit. No, I, I think you'd have to. Uh, first, first of all, I haven't thought through all of it all right. when you when you when you run down that list. But certainly, the whole question of how society is going to cope with narcotics and all associated things in the next generation and subsequently has to be seriously addressed in the context of crime that's generated from the bootlegging of it also so that we get away from the 
um, mythology of it. I'll give you a very good example. About seven or eight years ago. Mythology as in romanticization? No, well, the, well no, no, the mythology right. in, in relation to the story I'm just going to tell right. you. Okay. Having lunch with George Best, who's a good close friend of mine, he'd had a stomach implant, he was dying, dying in front of me. This, right. was, this was, he was in a bad state. And he was in Cork for something, and I said, come down and have lunch. And I think I was preparing the buzzer book or something. And we, ha- we went and had lunch, and he started off with a gin and tonic before lunch and another gin and tonic. Then with three bottles of wine, uh, and he, he drank two of them. And he was catching a five o'clock flight from right. Cork to London. Then he had three or four nappers. And I said, George, for fuck's sake, man. You know, you're killing yourself. Why didn't he? Because he'd, 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 he'd taken the implant and he was oh. still fucking drinking. He was right. throwing up, it was a nightmare. He'd had the implant out now. So I said, why didn't you smoke a joint? Oh no, he says, never fucking touch drugs. I said, what are you talking about? I think that is. Now, George thought cannabis or grass was some kind of, you know, uh, sensational departure from, uh, and I, he said it leads to heroin. I said, it doesn't fucking lead. The mythology is that one leads to the other. It doesn't. Yeah. I mean, the, the only reason people do those things is because they come from the same source and people wean them on. They're spiking the exit tablets and all of that. So we've got to accept that the science is there, the supply is there, the stuff is there, people are getting it. Most people who are using heroin, for example, don't die. Most people who are using coke don't have an addiction problem. It's just like alcohol, really. So if it's responsible for 80% of the crime, as we think it is, you see, it's always the poor who are victims of this. They're at the bottom end of the scale. The barrister from Shrewsbury Road or from Balls Bridge who snorts a bit of coke, a young guy, or the money dealer, you know, at the weekend to get a hit. Yeah. He's not going to, nothing's going to happen to him. Uh, nothing good. And people who are heroin addicts quietly just take their control it. They manage it. People smoke a joint. Okay. S- still, uh, these things are devastating for who people who are vulnerable. And it's people who are vulnerable who are, the, who are preyed upon by the dealers. And they're the people who commit crime. They're the people who can't afford to get their hit. They're the people who become addicts. Right. So what we should do, if we're honest as a, as a society, is, like other societies, address this. And some um, policemen in America and some policemen in Britain believe that these things should be decriminalised. Right. Um, maybe they shouldn't, maybe they should. But there's no use sort of saying to kids, you know, this is an appalling vista. This is, if you take a, a hit off a joint, you know, you're going to end up a junkie. Or if you take a line of coke. Or if, well, if you take you a line of coke. Would you say that to your own, bring it down to your own house? Uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, would you say that to your own kids? Would you say, go take it with my blessing, check it out, and come back and tell me what happened? I would, I've never discussed it with them, except the, with my daughter, the ecstasy. Right. I said, don't take anything you don't know. All right. As in, you don't know what to make above what it is? Yeah. Don't take it. You don't need it. And then she told you she's taking ecstasy then? No, she told me she's not taking ecstasy. She's not taking it? Mm. Okay. But I said to her that, look... Did she feel she was under peer pressure to do so? Well, she's going to discos, and yeah. I, I felt that um, she should know what the, the story was. All right. Uh, and the story is this, that uh, you don't know what you're getting, you're going to come down, you're young, you shouldn't need it. Uh, it's generally going to be messy. Yeah. Uh, so resist it if you can. But I've also said to them, if that never happens, come to me, Tell me. and we'll work it out. Right. So there's no terror involved. Right. You know, if you, you you won't be a bad person if you experiment. You'll be just like any other young people. We experimented when we were kids, and but they know you smoke dope, so they, there's no they don't. Terror. <laughs> Actually, no. All right. Okay. I don't. I mean, when I when I say I smoke, I have the odd joint. All right. Right. Usually, if I'm going to be bored. Uh, socially, all right. Late at night, in adult company, I'll, I'll smoke a joint. Okay. Uh, and there's, the thing about George is that the thing it it's much better than alcohol. All right, but are you fearful for your kids? Are you fearful for your son? I mean, do, no. they, do you think they will come to you with any kind of potential experience? That yes, they have done and they will do. Yeah, all right. we, because we're close. They know right. I'm very human. They know I'm very vulnerable. They know I'm, I'm very sort of childish. 
right. and I know that I haven't lost that thing, that I'm not a grown right. I'm not a grown up. Because there's a lot of kids now using turn to heroin for the come down after ecstasy. I mean, there's a whole syndrome now set in place where people after the nightclubs are turning to heroin or whatever. You know, it is leading to other drugs. Have you tried the other drugs? No. No. Why? I've had a couple of hits of coke. And what does that do for you? Didn't do that for me, actually. <laughs> did, you ever, did you ever use a working writing? Oh, no, no, no. no. Never, never. I never drink the day before, right? All right. I never drink. Uh, I get up in the morning at four. I work. And it's over by 12. All right. Uh, get up at 4 a.m. and work till midday. Get up around four or five. Work for however long it takes. Sometimes okay. it takes until two. Sometimes it's over at 10. Um, never. I'm funny enough, I'm reading an Auden biography there. Yes. And uh, he's, uh, I didn't realise until I got the word page wherever I am that he was a benzodrine addict. He yeah. used benzodrine to get him up. So it's Tennessee Williams. Tennessee Williams took a ridiculous concoction yeah. in the morning to get writing. Yeah. And you know, yeah. benzodrine, injection, yeah. a yeah. drink, yeah. a mix, yeah. a cocktail, and yeah, then yeah. go to the typewriter. Yeah. It's horrible syndrome to get kind of hooked on that. Well, whatever, whatever gets you through the day. You know, it's not for me to prescribe All for right. other people, um, except for myself. I have that sort of old thing from sport that, right. A, I go to bed at sort of nine the night before I write, uh, maybe two nights before I write. Uh, I don't drink. I don't go out. I don't even mix. I won't even have, go to dinner right. because it gets me head fuzzed up. You don't go to a brothel? No, I don't know. Well, uh, I don't know any brothels, actually. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there are. Well, you told that story last time about the team going to a brothel. Oh, yeah, the exactly. Well, yeah, yeah, I ran. Yeah, the night right. before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, extraordinary. That was my innocence. I mean, that was my first match. I was shocked. I still right. am shocked. Uh, that, that, we can talk about that, that later. But, but yeah. the other section, Coke didn't give you any hit and you, you, you stayed away no. from... What about acid and all that? In the no. Facility, rebel days? Well, we didn't have it, you see. That's why I'm so fucking daft now. I mean, I was, we were in the monastery then playing football. So oh, right. all of that stuff, no. I shared the... They use it in monasteries for potential religious experiences. So weren't all the ex explorations of yeah, LSD no, no. done in? Yeah, I mean, in, I mean, in I mean Aldous studies. Huxley used, yeah. used it. Um, so were you never inclined used, to say, I'd like to um, check open. that out? No. All right. No, I, I feel that the, the thing you've got to exercise that is your, your brain will not act actually, at the desk, function right if you're on anything. I think that there might be an argument for saying that mind-expanding drugs can help a writer, uh, not at the desk, but in a period of reflection, you know, in the pre-writing thing, like uh, um, you can probably, your perceptions can be sharpened, shall we say. Right. And your range of uh, vision and your emotional sort of state can be expanded. Uh, uh, but I do believe that the, the kind of your own innate resource, your own spirit, your own brain must be protected from that. I think it is actually the mini diminishing returns at some stage bound to come into it. But there's, there's a whole network of people out there, be they the bankers you're talking about, mm. who don't only do it at the weekend. We're getting increasingly involved. There's a lot of DJs, there's a lot of rock and roll writers, there's a lot of journalists, there's a lot mm. of TV people yeah. who probably, band managers, the whole shot. I mean, it, yeah. it is a strong of people who believe the opposite to what you're saying, that mm. they operate at optimum level yeah. when they're on their lines of coke. Yeah, but I, I, I believe that what I, what I have is passion. All right. And... My passion uh, is, is my drug. And you're connected with the spirit, which a lot of... Very, very, very much so. Right. Uh, yeah. Because I've very often soulful, drugs, very drugs disconnect people. They do, yeah. They don't want to be connected with the spirit. No, well, that's, a, that's exactly right. I have a very good friend who's in a very high-powered job in England uh, in publishing, and he's on Prozac all the time. All right. He's a young guy. Right. And uh, it's astonishing. They don't want that real connection. No, but I love it, see. And, the, you know, I, I'm, it, for me, it's all about staying in touch with your real feelings, sure. not allowing them to be corroded right. over by right. by cynicism, experience, contact with bad fuckers, sure. uh, seductive promises that you'll be an important man, yeah. all that stuff, no. Roots, soul, <laughs> that's my thing. With so that's my thing. With, with occasional blowouts to kind of keep the balance. And the, and the blowout is, my biggest blowout, Joe, is this. I'm never drunk, actually. I'm always laughing <laughs> because I'm, because I, because I, you know, it's so serious the gig. Like you're doing, your, it takes me a week yeah. to work out a column, right? And then I just go out and I have a lot of fun, right? Frivolity. Yeah, absolute total yeah. giggles, frivolity, golden guys, 
you know, winding them up, messing, uh, flirting, yeah. looping around the place. And there's a lot of night people that you and I know out there. Like, say, Jean, who's really very... St- and uh, Bill, maybe, yeah. or whatever. And um, I don't really... You can't really in- <clears throat> enjoy it if you're legless. But you pretty much, you, what you've just described is still very much an outsider to everyday society mm. in every way. Yeah, but like you work from home, you go out when you choose to, mm. you don't connect with the people you don't feel you want to be connected with, you don't mm. want to be connected with. So it's very much still retaining your, your uh, maverick or what outsider status. Yeah, I mean, I it's, am. It's that, I, I am a complete, nature. I'm a complete loner. I'm a very cold person. What does cold person? Yeah. Behind all of that, I'm a cold, cold person. Well, how can you be passionate and cold? Passionate about writing and you don't give a fuck about people? No, I, I, I love the... Uh, I, lo- I, li- I like a certain kind of person. I like people who are unconventional, uh, people who are unafraid, uh, and people who are maybe um, not sort of at it, if you like. You know, I mean, I've got friends like Pearson Zay or McGuinness, right. uh, guys like that. Tony Cronin, who's a great friend of mine, right. who's, you know, I, sort of, um, I suppose you would say I like Bohemian people. I like that type of Bohemian type of person. Oh, but what do you mean by I'm a cold person? You don't strike me as, what do you mean? When it comes I, to really giving of yourself? No, when it comes to working out what's got to be done, the separation of business and pleasure, the separation, making a distinction between a bond, a friendship that was very close and an acquaintance that was fun, uh, someone that you love to be around and have crack with, say, once a fortnight. I, I, I'm I, very, very private about my... No one knows my troubles, no one knows my business, like all my family things. You, you, I mean, Gabriel has asked me a dozen times to go and talk about that. Uh, fuck off. You know. Your family situation? Yeah, or anything right. like that. Any of my... Private business, no one knows anything. You never see me in the Terry King column, you know, or right. any other column like that. Right. So I'm cold about that. I'm, I know that there's a certain. Um, maybe for example, maybe protective I get, rather than cold. I give you a good example. Uh, in the public arena, I write about soccer. Blah, 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 blah. I wouldn't write about poetry or say literature, which are things that, that privately I'm a, a real amateur enthusiast of. And I have great knowledge. People were shocked when I wrote James Heaney. Yeah, well, you did there. Pardon? You did there. Right? Yeah, well, it was, I it just felt compelled to. Right. It, was such an, it was such an abominable, right. uh, treacherous thing All right. uh, to happen, uh, for it to be mindlessly celebrated the way it was. And uh, I, I just had to. I felt compelled to. But I'd always make a distinction between, like someone asked me recently, would I write a piece about my favourite poem and why? I said, no. I don't know. I don't, I'm not a professional. All right. Right? Yeah. Get someone else to do it. So I'd be kind of ruthless in that regard. Um, and I, um, I'm i quite ruthless in my friendships too. That That's where it stops. And that's why I'm friends with that person. That's why I'm friends with that person. And that's why I'm friends with that person. But is that calculated and manipulative when you're... It's not manipulative, no. It's, it's calculated, though. Right. Uh, it's calculated to use... No, absolutely not. I, I think right. friendship is for is for is for mutual pleasure. All right. Uh, but I'm not a kind of um, a kind of mindlessly jolly, passionate guy. You know, I'm a tough fucker, and I'm a tough fucker in work. I have to be. Um, Were you um, always that protective about your emotional core? Yeah. Were you? Yeah. Going right back to childhood. Yeah. Why? Hi, Joe Jackson here again. I thank you for listening to this edition of the Joe Jackson Interviews podcast. More can be heard on my website, joejacksoninterviewer.com.